Good morning and, and Happy New Year. It is a pleasure to be with you today speaking on making Jesus our center by exploring the stories of coming to God as a child and the rich ruler from Luke uh, 15 through 30. I think most of you know me and my family, but just real briefly, um, I have been married to my wife Edie for 31 years and we have been blessed with four children. The oldest is married and our youngest is a sophomore in college. My vocation is a management consultant, helping businesses with their investing and financing decisions, working with financial statements, numbers, money, etc. So it's a bit ironic that I'm speaking today on the topic of wealth and possessions. And I must say that, that the preparation has been insightful for my own walk, walk with the Lord. So before we begin, let's, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for uh, your goodness, Father, for your faithfulness. Um, we are so blessed that we are able to come together and worship you and learn from your word. And Father, uh, I just pray that everyone who hears these words, Father, uh, would be blessed by them. And I pray that if, if I say anything wrong, that those words would quickly, would quickly fall away. Um, but we just ask, Father, that you would be exalted, Father, as we learn about coming to you as a child and, and also the, the temptations of this world. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our scripture uh, that the sermon is based on is from Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 30. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now, when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. The kingdom of God turns conventional wisdom upside down all the time. And in these passages, we see Jesus calling his followers to be like children. Children certainly weren't wise according to conventional wisdom. And to not put anything, especially riches, ahead of the kingdom of God was also not wise according to conventional wisdom. While scripture calls us to be childlike, it does not call us to be childish, but to grow and mature in our faith. Ed Welch writes, what or who you need will control you. Everyone needs Jesus. It's just that not everyone knows it. We know that children need parents, but as we get older, we need people less for care. We need them for relationships and companionships, but usually not dependency, hopefully. And as we mature, I suspect we may even be tempted to think that we need no one. But the truth is, in Luke's story of the little children, we are to come to Jesus as someone in need. In contrast to the rich ruler who thought he didn't need anything. 
And when Jesus told the ruler what was keeping him from salvation, he wasn't wise enough to know that his money controlled him, or if he knew, even worse, he couldn't bear to part with it. So as we look more closely at these scriptures, there are three main points in the bulletin. Uh, the, the first point is God's kingdom becoming like a child. Second, man's kingdom letting go of this world. And third, Jesus' call, total dependence on him. So first, let's talk about uh, what God's kingdom's like, becoming like a child. Reading this passage on childlike faith reminded me of a story when my children used to jump off the stairs to catch me, or for, <laughs> for me to catch them. Our prior home had a fairly steep set of stairs between the first and second floors. And when our children were small, they used to leap from the stairs to catch, for me to catch them. Now, they really weren't that far away from me. Um, and, and, and in fact, initially, they would have both feet planted on the steps, and they would reach their arms out toward me. And some of my children were more risk averse than others and just kind of stood there and were hesitant at first. But eventually, it became a game of who could run up the stairs a few, a few steps, you know, seven, eight, or nine steps turn and jump for me to catch. And again, while at first there was hesitancy, eventually they all joined in and, and even begged for me to catch them. Now our youngest son, Michael, whose permission I have to tell this story, was perhaps three or four years old at the time. And his first time playing, he didn't check to see that I was paying attention and was ready for him before he jumped. So there were a few close calls as I was catching one child while Michael launched himself from the steps before my arms had completely set down the other child. Now, fortunately, I never dropped one of them, but I did have to be quick. Uh, I do remember uh, Edie and I talking to our youngest son about waiting until my arms were free and you know he had my attention. So he did wait. But the moment we made eye contact, he would launch like a missile with no regard for anything else. His, his childlike faith, totally assuming that I would catch him uh, and all my children, actually, but and never doubting that I wouldn't catch him, was placing total dependency on me to follow through and do what I said I would do in this case, in this case, catch them. So when looking at our, our scripture verses 15 through 17, Luke records Jesus saying that the kingdom of God belongs to children such as these and denies entry to anybody who is not prepared to receive the kingdom of God like a child. It is part of what is involved in becoming a disciple. And for adults, for me, this is a humbling call for our, by our Lord. So let's dig a little bit deeper on, on God's children belonging to these, that God's kingdom belonging to these children. And, and let me just reread a, a few of these verses. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus calling them to him, called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter. As I re researched this passenger, pa passage, some biblical commentators emphasized more than others that the parents were bringing infants. We see the passage says, let the children come, but in verse 15, it specifically says they were bringing even infants. So it's pretty clear. Um, and, and we know infants can do little on their own. They essentially have no power, nothing to contribute, little ability to help out their family. Now they are cute, but they are totally dependent on their parents. And this passage is really about getting at having this childlike trust and faith and coming to Jesus without anything of our own. So what does childlike faith and trust in Jesus look like? Well, I think it looks like total dependence on God. So why were, why were infants brought to Jesus in the first place? Well, scripture says that he might touch them. So I, I wonder why would the parents of these infants want him to touch their children? Well, Jesus was seen as a teacher, a prophet. His fame had spread far and wide. He performed miracles and the people knew it. Like the gospel account of the woman who bled for 12 years and just wanted to touch Jesus's garment to be healed. 
So Jesus exalted these children by telling his followers that children were an example of God's kingdom, which again is always opposite the way the world works. In much of the ancient world around Jesus' time, children were regarded as a burden until they were physically strong and could contribute or, or work for the family. And they were vulnerable to sickness. Today, the U.S. infant mortality rate is about 0.6%, so less than 1%. But in Jesus' day, it is thought that the infant mortality rates were as high as 30%. Therefore, parents were likely bringing infants to Jesus for his blessing, his healing, and protection. But just picture the commotion of parents bringing infants to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. It was likely a noisy gathering, but he wanted children near him to simply be with him. This in uninhibited father-child relationship is the way God's kingdom operates, not putting obstacles between us and God, but directly coming to God through Jesus. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Heaven exists for those who come to Jesus as a child. We see Jesus exalting these children as representative, elevating them as an example of God's kingdom, even though they offered nothing. They came without pretense, without anything, totally dependent on their parents at this stage in their lives. In the next verse, we see the disciples try to stop this act, but, but why would they? If the parents were simply wanting Jesus to bless their children, why did the disciples rebuke the people that were bringing the children? Perhaps they thought Jesus didn't have time or that he had more lofty goals to accomplish. Maybe they didn't like the commotion. Maybe this didn't look dignified that their leader was spending time with children. It's certainly not the image of a powerful ruler that they had wanted. And instead of spending time with children, perhaps they thought there are important people for Jesus to meet. Ironically, like they have time and time again, and as do we, his disciples fail to understand the nature and kingdom of God. Now, it seems plausible that the disciples wanted to be sure Jesus had time for important people like the rich ruler that we'll look at momentarily. Uh, perhaps they were thinking, you know, let's, let's get the children out of here. Let's let the powerful rulers come in. Because remember, the disciples still thought Jesus was going to start a revolution and overthrow Rome. And further, at least in, in our heart, I'll, I'll speak for myself here, there's an inclination in our hearts to show favoritism based on status, power, and wealth. Let's be seen with the important people those who have influence. But Jesus says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of God. The word that is translated as let has several meanings, to, to send away, leave alone, permit. In other words, permit the little children to go away from or allow them to leave their parents and go to Jesus, for the kingdom exists for such as these. Such as these refers to the powerless, the unproven, those lacking in credentials, the dependent. The kingdom is for the neglected, outcast, forgotten, the small, and is about to be contrasted with the rich, the powerful, the credentialed. There are no adults of God, only children of God. Childlike faith is leaving our old life behind and coming to our Father with nothing but our faith, trust, and obedience. It is making Jesus our center. So do you see yourself as powerless, dependent, without status? Or do you think like the disciples that Jesus' time is best reserved for the elite, the powerful, the famous, and you think yourself as one of them? Or maybe you think Jesus' time is for the elite, powerful, and famous, but you are not one of them. Instead, do you feel like you're not good enough to come to Jesus? Well, Jesus says, let the children come and do not hinder them. That means you and me. And even though we have nothing to offer and much to speak against us, he invites us to come to him as a child. So we've looked at, at what God's kingdom is like, becoming little children. Now let's look at an example of man's kingdom. And 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 letting go of this world. So the second, second uh, point in the outline is man's kingdom, which is always at odds with God's kingdom. 
It is difficult for us to let go of the things of this world, our accomplishments, our possessions. And in verses 18 to 25, Luke purposefully contrasts the rich ruler with the scene of the little children. Unlike the children, the ruler had power. We don't specifically know what kind of ruler, but, and a ruler asked, it says in verse 18. Could be religious, could be civil. Nevertheless, his title as ruler likely garnered respect. Unlike the children, the ruler had status and a good reputation. In other gospel accounts, we are told he is a young ruler, which means he likely was wise beyond his years, very smart, driven. He contributed to society. He was a lawful Jew, a good citizen, as it talks about in verse 21. Unlike the children, the ruler had wealth and possessions. When Jesus tells him to sell all he possesses in verse 22, we are told in verse 23 that he is extremely rich. Not just rich, but extremely rich. With that kind of wealth, the ruler likely had no worries about people liking him, being accepted, putting food on his table. He probably had servants to take care of tasks like that. The rich ruler then addresses Jesus with, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And instead of answering the ruler with, just believe in me, Jesus engages with him, which really is an act of love, even though it's challenging. We often think confrontation is bad, and it certainly can be, but not always. And sometimes confronting someone is the most loving thing we can do. Regarding the ruler calling Jesus good teacher, it does seem strange. And in verse 19, Jesus forces the ruler to be introspective by asking, why do you call me good? Is it because the ruler thought he was good like Jesus? If so, that is a critical error in thinking. For the, the term good means good to the core, good in the purest, holiest sense. Jesus probes his question, but he wants the ruler to think about what he had just asked. And Jesus always answers the issues of the heart rather than the surface questions that we may ask. In recorded Jewish law, rabbis were never addressed as good rabbi. And, and saying good teacher was highly honoring of Jesus, but unusual. Now, today, it's not strange or unusual to speak of of someone, a man or a woman, as good, but to address them as such, as in a title, is odd even today. For instance, good wife, good teacher, good employer just doesn't sound right, let alone feel right. Um, while I love Pastor Luke, I don't call him good pastor or good teacher. I suspect I could, but I think he'd know I was up to something if I did. Likewise, I don't call my wife good wife. Um, Perhaps I could, maybe, maybe I should as a joke, but I don't do that. Jesus doesn't say that he's not good, but that no one is good except God alone. He is dispelling the notion that we can be good apart from God. Now, some scholars interpret this exchange as, don't call me good unless you're willing to call me God. In other words, you can't call Jesus good without also acknowledging his divinity. And as his followers, we can't call Jesus good until we acknowledge that. And as C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity, uh, at which, which, and the phrase was later coined by Josh McDowell of Lord Liar or Lunatic, Jesus does not leave us with the choice of being good without being divine. He is either a liar, a lunatic, or he is who he says he is, our Lord. So after telling the ruler that no one is good except God alone, he answers the questions about what I must do to inherit or obtain eternal life. Jesus then tells the ruler, you know the commandments. In verse 18, when the ruler asks what he must do, this seems like maybe something in his life was lacking. You know, maybe he didn't feel like Jewish, the Jewish teaching had adequately answered his questions. Perhaps he was looking at his good behavior, his wealth, his possessions, his status, and he still felt empty inside. So he wanted to know, what can I do to obtain this? 
I suspect in one sense, we all do that. We want to inherit eternal life. Now for us as Christians, hopefully from the perspective of the other side of the cross, but we know there is nothing we can do. Jesus has already done it, bought us, redeemed us, atoned for us. The ruler does appear to have pure intentions of finding out what else he must do. It seems sincere. He, he doesn't appear to be trying to trick Jesus as the Pharisees were wont to do. Perhaps he just couldn't put his finger on it. It's possible that he was truly doubting he was good enough, but he didn't know what else he could do. So in a public setting, he asks Jesus, what must I do? Perhaps he did want public acclamation. Perhaps he is expecting Jesus to tell him, you're good. It's a lock. You're in. He's not asking how and by what means shall I attain eternal life. Rather, what must I do? He may simply have been looking for affirmation of his merits and the reward due him for his life of piety. Then Jesus shows the ruler his life under the bright lights of truth. Jesus directs the man to the second part of the Decalogue. He lists all the commandments that the ruler thinks he is following, the ones dealing with how to treat other people as listed in verses 19 and 20. Rules, doing, performing are obviously important to the ruler. And then when he responds, all these have I kept from my youth. As an aside, it's interesting to hear how many times do or do not come up in these verses. The truth is that we can't do anything to save ourselves. Only Jesus can. And we don't know if the ruler ever got this or not. And when Jesus tells him, you know the commandments, he is really calling him to obey them. Like with children, when we say, you know the rules, or we ask our children, what did I say? We're not really asking them to tell us the rules or if they heard what we just said. We're really saying, obey the rules that you already know. Jesus is really saying, dear ruler, obey the commandments. But Jesus knows that he is not obeying all of them. Regardless of the ruler's motivation, he didn't get what he was looking for, and he has unwittingly set himself up to Jesus. And Jesus didn't quote all the Ten Commandments, but he specifically mentions five of them, and, and even a little out of order. Number seven, do not commit adultery. Number six, do not murder. Number eight, do not steal. Number nine, do not bear false witness. And number five, honor your father and mother. And then the rich ruler responds in verse 21, all these I have kept from my youth. Well, the ruler seems a bit overconfident in stating he has kept these from his youth, at least to me. Per perhaps he has. Maybe he kept the commandments per the letter of the law, but what about in his heart? Okay, he literally hasn't murdered anyone. He literally hasn't stolen anything. But Jesus wants him to understand that obeying the commandments is more than just what you do or don't do. Jesus goes straight for his heart, like with the Sermon on the Mount. If you've looked at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery. We too may look back on our youth and conclude, I was a good kid. And at least for me, I was outwardly a pretty good kid, mostly obeyed my parents and authorities, teachers, didn't steal or murder. But I know I wasn't a good kid in my heart. The ruler likely kept these commandments outwardly, but not necessarily in thought, although the text doesn't say. But in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus shows that it is more than obeying outward commands, but what comes from inside, from the heart, that is, that is what is sinful. So we, G, we, we see Jesus listing the commands the ruler was following outwardly, but omitting those he wasn't in commandments one through four, those that relate to loving God wholeheartedly, and the 10th commandment related to coveting. Jesus then responds with the same language the ruler uses in terms of performance and doing. And in verse 22, Jesus says, one thing you still lack. That is, you still have more to do. The law is a harsh task master. So we see Jesus addressing him in the same manner on his level. One of the most classic rock songs from the 70s was Led Zeppelin's famous song, Stairway to Heaven. And while the entire meaning of that song is debatable, the, the first couple of verses talk about a lady buying a, a stairway to heaven as if she could. Now, we all know that Jesus wasn't telling the ruler to sell all and you're a lock for eternal life. But in a way, that's what the ruler was doing, hoping 
he was going to be able to buy or earn, literally earn his way to heaven. Further, Jesus tells the ruler to sell everything in order to have eternal life. And in 20, verse 22, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Was Jesus being literal? Maybe he was in this instance. But Jesus' answer runs far deeper than the act itself. Jesus knows that the act of letting go of the material wealth and the comforts that they ensured and then giving this away would likely have filled the hole in the rich ruler's soul. Jesus was exposing his heart, revealing his idols of wealth, achievement, power, and having other gods before the Lord. Jesus doesn't comment on his claim to be obedient to the law, but rather gives him four commands, which really address the other five commandments that Jesus didn't specifically mention. He says, sell all your possessions. In other words, get rid of those idols that hold you back from putting me first. Take those proceeds and give to the poor. Sell all of those possessions, convert to money, give that away, put aside your self-sufficiency, and put your trust in me. He's, he's really hitting on verses one through four and, and or, I'm sorry, commandment one through four and, and commandment 10 in that. Putting God first, getting rid of, of all that you hold dear. And then come, that's his third command to the rich ruler. Be like a child that we just read about a few verses ago that were just sitting on Jesus' lap. And follow me, be a disciple, bear my cross. When Jesus tells the ruler to sell all that you have, he's asking the ruler to put the pursuit of heaven above all else in his life, even at the cost of everything he holds dear. And we know that Jesus's arrow hits the target, that is the ruler's heart, because we are told he became very sad. And, and in fact, it says, but when he heard these things, verse 23 says, he became very sad because he was extremely rich. Jesus continues talking to the ruler in his own terms by saying to him how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. He words it in terms of doing. It is a hard thing, how hard it is to earn your way into heaven. In fact, it's impossible. Jesus knew this would be hard for the ruler to hear. Jesus' answer meant giving up his wealth, his status, his power, his achievements, likely his most treasured possessions. And if the ruler followed through, he would have the same worldly status as that child who we read about a few verses ago. In fact, this points out that the rich ruler loved riches more than God, showing that he had kept neither the first, you shall have no other gods before me, or the tenth, you shall, have, you shall not covet. For riches were his God, and he desired them more than the Father. Now, the law doesn't command us to sell all, but rather to put aside all that keeps us from God. And it expressly condemns righteousness or covetousness. So Jesus is correcting the rich ruler here. You know, you can almost imagine the ruler for a moment when Jesus says one thing you lack. I almost wonder if the, 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 the ruler is thinking, ah, the teacher's about ready to tell me what I can do to assure eternal life. But Jesus goes for the one hang up, this besetting sin, this, this ruler's biggest idol. And then Jesus digs a little bit deeper when he says in verse 25, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus picks the largest land mammal known in the Middle East and contrasts it with the smallest opening they would have likely known about the eye of a needle. And riches were generally assumed to be a sign of God's favor in the Old Testament. But, but that is not what Jesus is saying. He is again turning things upside down, overturning conventional wisdom. Therefore, the ruler's accomplishments count for nothing, and Jesus wasn't impressed with what the ruler had inherited or amassed. Furthermore, the ruler's idolization of his accomplishments were preventing him from obtaining the very thing he wants, what he asked for. He wants to move up the ladder toward eternal life, but Jesus is telling him to move down the ladder to have eternal life. And as I said a moment, we know that riches in and of themselves are not bad. They do not prevent us from eternal life. Rather, it is the love of riches, putting our wealth, comfort, security, and anything but God reveals that our heart is not truly committed to him. 
and that we are not fully trusting and obeying him. So is Jesus our center or is it wealth or some other idol? Like the rich ruler, do you feel like something is missing? Have you been trying to climb the ladder of success and prove yourself how good you can be, but still feel like something is missing? What are you looking for to bolster your status with man or God? So we've now looked at God's kingdom being like a child, and we look at man's kingdom. Let's lastly look at the disciples' question about this and Jesus' response. And um, the, the last, the third item is called Jesus's call, total dependence on him. And this one will be shorter. So we're, we're getting near the end. So the, the story of the rich ruler does seem to hit a low point in verse 26. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? Almost in despair. If this ruler isn't good enough, then who? If the cost to be saved is this high, then how? Jesus tells them, Nobody is good. Only God is good. Back to the ruler's initial question involving the word good. But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And then Peter speaks. Peter has watched all this play out, and it seems his emotions take over. And don't you love how he impulsively states whatever comes to mind? I, I certainly can relate to Peter's emotional and reactive speech. You can feel Peter's exasperation in verse 28. We have done this. What, is, what does that mean about us, he's saying? He says, see, we have left our homes and followed you. Peter uses the word apiame for left, which I looked that up, by the way. Um, that was previously used in verse 16 about the children letting, about, about letting the children come to God. So the same word is used uh, here when Peter says we have left. And when Jesus says, let the children, Peter is saying, we have left everything behind to come and follow you. What he's really asking is, what about us? What do we get for following you, for sacrificing, giving up all to follow you? We have become like children. We have left homes. We have left behind jobs, possessions. We have trusted in you. We have followed you. And then Jesus assures Peter that his words are true. Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Letting go of the things of this world for the sake of following God leads to eternal life. That eternal life begins now in this time and in this age to come eternal life. Both the already and the not yet. We have the blessing of having been saved being saved, and will be saved to be with God forever. The implications of Jesus' words are leaving or setting aside what distracts us from the kingdom of God. Christianity, the good news of the gospel, means a total surrender to God. Everything must be brought under his lordship. For the ruler, it was wealth. But for you and me, the idols may very well look different. We are not to forsake our responsibilities, but if things get in the way of living for Christ, then we must deny what inhibits us. Selling all and then not providing or taking care of our families is not what's asked. That's not responsible. Rather, self-denial is required, not harmful or irresponsible treatment or action towards loved ones. But if those people in our life cause us but if people in our life cause us to stumble, then we need to think about the implications and ensure that they are not keeping us from following Christ with our whole hearts. And here we get to the real point of all these passages. What is impossible with man for, for man is impossible with God. We can do nothing to earn our salvation, but Jesus has done this already. We are saved by faith in Christ and can do nothing on our own to reach the kingdom of God. And in fact, we enter the kingdom with empty hands, childlike faith, and total dependence. So what should we do? What else are you holding on to? Do you have complete faith and trust in Jesus? Or are you holding on to what you love most and cherish and also Jesus? If you are, he calls you to let go and trust and obey him entirely. 
hopefully we cry out, God, help, be merciful to me, a poor sinner, and then come to Christ with childlike faith, without pretense or fake commitment, but with transparent humility before our Creator, who knows us and all about us, regardless of how much we think or act otherwise. Good works won't save us. Religious piety won't save us. Only acknowledgement of our sinful reproach to God, admitting we can't save anyone, let alone ourselves, and calling on the name of Jesus can save us. So let's rejoice that God came in Jesus Christ to atone for our sins and set us right before God. And in doing so, we can live freely for him, living our lives to his glory and praise and making Jesus the center of our existence. Please pray with me. Oh, Father, we thank you so much for our Savior, Jesus. We thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for his wisdom, the way he taught, the way he loved, the way he confronted. Help us to more fully understand what it means to trust and obey you with childlike faith, to set aside our own agenda, and to be totally dependent on you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.